Welcome to Loyola Marymount University. I'm Fernando Guerra, professor and director of the Center for the Study of Los Angeles. Uh, today we have with us John Chung, state controller, former member of the Board of Equalization, and uh, probably a candidate for another statewide office that we'll talk about in, in a second. Uh, today we're going to talk about the state of California, uh, politics in California, Los Angeles, and of course about the emergence of Asian office holders and the emergence of the Asian vote and how that's been uh, transforming not only Los Angeles, California, but I think even uh, national elections when we put it into the right context. Um, John Chung is a, the son of uh, immigrant parents. Uh, he went on to the University of South Florida before they had a football team. Now they have a real good one ever since John left. Uh, he had got his degree in finance. He also went to a great Jesuit university, Georgetown uh, University, for his law degree. And he uh, then came back or moved to uh, uh, California where he's been active in politics and in finance and uh, all kinds of civic endeavors. Uh, he first got elected to um, the Board of Equalization in 1998. He served two terms, including three years as uh, chair. Then he was elected in 2006 as uh, California's chief fiscal officer, which is the controller, the controller of the state of California. In 2012, uh, John Chung was a recipient of the Asian Heritage Society's Special Recognition Award at the ninth annual uh, Asian Heritage Awards Gala. Uh, the job of uh, Controller uh, uh, Chung is to provide sound fiscal control over 90 billion in public funds, an incredible amount uh, of funds and incredible uh, responsibility that he has. In addition to being controller because of the position, uh, he has to serve on over 81 boards and commissions including the very important CalPERS and CalSTRS, which we will discuss in a moment. Uh, of course, Controller Chung is kept in check by his wife, Cherry Chi, and they live in uh, very close to Loyola Marymount University in Torrance, California. Uh, Controller Chung, welcome. I'm delighted to be here. Um, let's start off with, um, board of, what got you interested in politics to begin with? Why did you decide that you were going to run for public office? Well, so I officially qualified to join AARP this year, so I turned 52 months ago. So I, I was raised in a very different era. Uh, born in 1962, on your charts you pointed out Ed Roybal, uh, that was a very transformative time. And so I was named after John F. Kennedy to give a sense of timing. And we were the first Asian Pacific American family in our community in suburban Chicago, and we were discriminated against. And so I was just interested in trying uh, to create a better world. As a child, you're just discriminated against. It's painful, you're isolated, you're excluded. And so it just formed my values then, and it forms the way I govern today. Inclusion, everybody has value. What took you to South Florida? Actually, University of South Florida is actually not in South Florida. It's in Tampa Bay, but it uh, is. it's called South Florida. Well, there's why, multiple, why, there's why, multiple why branch Tampa campuses. Bay? Well, I actually started off, I won the top accounting scholarship at DePaul University as the oldest child of immigrant parents. Uh, and they, they went through tough times, not much money coming through here. My dad got his PhD, did all the good stuff. Uh, but they said, hey, try to get some scholarships. So I won the uh, top accounting scholarship at DePaul University. I didn't research it very well, uh, so it didn't have the same uh, college lifestyle that I wanted. You wanted all these different opportunities. You get, I'm not putting it down, the, but I just wanted more. And so I just decided to explore and ended up in Florida. Mm -hmm. And then after that, Georgetown. Yeah, Georgetown was absolutely magnificent, uh, obviously. Uh, the, the home of the political center uh, in the United States, obviously massive influence, so great education, great opportunity to try to make the world a better place working on Capitol Hill and the other affiliated organizations. But you wanted to be a lawyer? Uh, I wanted to be actually a civil rights lawyer when I was young. Now, p part of it, when I was really young, it was convoluted. So my mom, being a mom from Taiwan, wanted all of her kids to be the ultimate success story. They wanted, she wanted all of us to be surgeons. So I am, the, I am the oldest son who's a failure. I'm the state controller of California, not a surgeon. Uh, <laughs> and so, but when we used to go back to Taiwan, you know, nearly every other year, and my uh, mom's dad was a lawyer. And so early on, he got paid with a chicken in a rural community in Taiwan. And I just thought that was so cool. I said, oh, here's grandpa. He's doing good stuff, helping poor people. So when I was six or seven, I wanted to be an attorney. So did you ever get paid with a chicken? Uh, I have not. Okay. Uh, but a pro well, I won't even go. I'll, uh, I'll, I'll drop that one right there. Uh, so then, what brought you to California? Uh, it's California. It's it's the dream. Uh, it, you know, it has a magnificent image, creates great opportunities, incredible diversity, uh, hopes and aspirations. So the I was going to go to the place that was the leading edge of the United States of America. 
Okay, but even as diverse as California is, um, who were your role models in terms of politics? You mentioned JFK in terms of national politics, but when you take a look at California, when you, you were growing up and you, had, you received your law degrees and you come here, there aren't many Asian elected officials. Yeah, it wasn't California uh, politicians who were my model. When I was young, it was named after John F. Kennedy, Robert F. Kennedy, Cesar Chavez, uh, Martin Luther King. Uh, I wanted to grow up, and later on, as you watched law, the uh, third good marshal. You're just thinking, all these people help create a better society. And then I was, you know, a little bit strange. So when I was 11, I watched the Watergate hearings, and then I saw uh, Peter Rodino, so a congressman you're, you're, you're from New Jersey. You're 11 years old, and you're watching Watergate. Yeah, I'm watching okay. the Watergate hearings. I was fascinated one summer, and then no, I no saw, wonder your mom was disappointed. <laughs> but go ahead. <laughs> I saw Father Drynan, uh, Father yeah. Drynan, who's a, a Catholic priest, who's a congressman from Massachusetts, uh -huh. so all those things you're growing up, it's like, God, he's a congressman, he, you know, he has multiple degrees, he's really smart, he's a lawyer, he's a priest, and they, I'm Catholic. I said, the only problem with him is he's not the Yankee shortstop. And then, uh, and then I saw Daniel Inouye, uh, who's uh, still today the yeah. senator from Hawaii, and he served in the World War II, and he had to live some painful stories. Even though he fought for this country, he came back and he was still discriminated against. So you had all these varying images of who was Americans who's fighting to make this country a better place. Mm -hmm. And so that's just, that's the story of America. Yeah, so to put uh, this into context, we're gonna show you right now some slides to talk, that talk about Asian American politics in Los Angeles and California. And if you take a look at these slides, you'll be able to see what uh, John is talking about in terms of the lack of Asians, especially early in, in, the, in the 60s and 70s. Let's take a look at those slides. This is a preview of a forthcoming report about the status of minority politics in Los Angeles and California. These slides focus specifically on the status of Asian Americans from 1959 to 2011 using four different data sets. This is a contextual chart documenting the ethnic demographic shift in Los Angeles County. This is data from the U.S. Census Bureau. This is a contextual chart documenting the ethnic demographic shift in California. This is also data from the U.S. Census Bureau. These are the criteria for the top 100 elected positions in Los Angeles County. The selection criteria is constituent size, budget size, prestige of the position, in other words, career path, and opinion of the leaders. And the list of positions are Mayor of LA, LA County Board of Supervisors, LA City Council members, Congress members, state senators, and assembly members representing Los Angeles, LA USD representatives, LA CCD representatives, additional city and county executives. This is a graphic representation of the top 100 elected positions in Los Angeles County in order of ranking. The ranking is starting from the most powerful position, Mayor of LA, followed by Los Angeles County Board of Supervisors, followed by the District Attorney, County Sheriff, and Los Angeles City Attorney, followed by the House of Representatives, followed by the State Senate, followed by the Los Angeles City Controller and County Assessor, followed by the State Assembly and the Los Angeles City Council, followed by the LAUSD School Board, and followed by the LACCD Board of Trustees. This chart documents the change of minority incorporation of the top 100 elected positions in Los Angeles County from 1959 to 2011. These are the criteria for the top 300 elected positions in California. The selection criteria is constituent size, budget size, prestige of position, in other words, career path and the opinion of the leaders. The list of positions consists of constitutional officers, Congress members, state senators, and assembly members, county board of supervisors of top 10 counties by population, and city council members of the top 10 cities by population. This chart documents the change in minority incorporation of the top 300 elected positions in California from 1959 to 2011. This chart documents Asian American representation at the regional, state, and federal levels. The incorporation ratio is the number of Asian American officials to the percentage of Asian Americans living in each of the 88 cities of Los Angeles County. This is a running roster of the district representatives for the California Board of Equalization from 1959 to 2011. Representatives are color-coded by ethnicity 
to track changes in ethnic representation over time. This is a running roster of the California State Supreme Court from 1959 to 2011. California State Supreme Court justices are color-coded by ethnicity to track changes in ethnic representation over time. This is the running roster of the Monterey Park City Council from 1959 to 2011. Council members are color-coded by ethnicity to track changes in ethnic representation over time. This is a running roster of the San Marino City Council from 1959 to 2011. Council members are color-coded by ethnicity to track changes in ethnic representation over time. State Controller Chung, when you take a look at these slides, what, what, what sticks out for you? Well, I, I just think it just reflects uh, the progress of America, the demographics of America. Uh, I think as we have more immigrants, as we, as we have more diversification, diversity in our communities, mm -hmm. and you build the relationships, our politics are going to change. Uh, the Cam Kawada who passed away was one of California's top right. political consultants. He said, people vote for people they're comfortable with. And so if you go to school with people of diverse backgrounds, mm -hmm. you know, you don't look at their differences. You may recognize some things that are different about them, but you understand that you have a common bond. When we were discriminated against in suburban Chicago, my mom is a devout Catholic. She goes to church every day. At the end of the day, she goes, John, she goes, it's hard now, but people will understand that we're more like them than different. Over a period of time, they will join us. And it was just a very powerful story, so, very meaningful story that what, my mom what, shared. What form did discrimination take for you and your family in Chicago? Well, we had ugly racial epithets uh, spray painted on our garage, go home gook, go home Jap, go home chink. Uh, I used to get into fights. It was hard. I, one of my closest friends in junior high school, you, uh, her brother used to taunt my brother, step on his sandwich uh, nearly every day, and one day I just had it. I'm like, so my brother's a really nice kid. He's not going to get into a fight, but you know, I was the one who had, was a little more volatile. So I, I drew the line, got into a fight with him. He stopped stomping on my brother's lunch, but I got suspended for one base, a basketball game. And I was on the basketball team, and I loved basketball. So the principal said, hey, John, you know, the, uh, what you did's wrong, what he did's wrong, but violence isn't the reaction. So um, coming back to, to California, you, the time that you're growing up and probably the time you come back to California, it's not unusual when you take a look at the Asian community that at that time about 50% of uh, um, voters are registered Democrats, another 50% Republicans. Why did you become a Democrat? Oh, just e easy from early on because of the civil rights issue. Which party was willing to embrace the hopes and opportunities for more people, including me? And now, how do you get involved? How do you get elected to the Board of Equalization? Well, they, well first of all, what is the Board of Equalization? I mean, most people still don't even know what this, uh, it's an elected body. Some consider it statewide, but it's got districts, so it's a little bit convoluted. Tell uh, the uh, students and the viewers the, the uh, kind of the history of the Board of Equalization and, and what it's supposed to do. Well, you don't want all the technicals, right? The Board of Equalization created in 1870, later declared unconstitutional because it exceeds its authority. Uh, 1878, constitutional amendment, 1879. Uh, but basically, it's one of the executive branch offices in the state of California. It's the elected tax authority for the state of California. Equalization refers to property taxes, but they're most well known for the application of sales taxes. Mm -hmm. They, they have jurisdiction of close to 30 different taxes here in the state of California. So, but how does it work? What happens? We pay our taxes, our sales tax, when we go to the store or when we buy gas, and then how does the Board of Equalization deal with that? Or what, what is their primary role in that? So the obligation on sales tax is on the retailer here in California. Some places, some places place the obligation on the consumer. So if you go in and you purchase a tangible personal product, uh, then the, there's a, a, a responsibility by the retailer to remit that tax to the Board of Equalization. Uh, what people get confused about is the obligations actually on the retailer. If you pay sales tax, actually technically you're paying sales tax reimbursement. They don't have to charge you, but they're being smart business people. They're charging you, but the obligation's on the retailer. They pass that tax on to the state. It depends on how much they have in sales as to whether they pre-file, whether they file quarterly, or whether they file yearly. And then what happens to that money? They bring it back, they, they give it to the a, uh, appropriate governmental entity or how does that work? That money goes into the general fund and so the general fund is part of the largest pot of money here in the state of California. In, in any given year, 51 to 53 percent of the uh, tax dollars here in California from the general fund are spent for education, 28 to 30 percent are spent for health care and welfare, uh, 8 to 10 percent is used for corrections. So kind of an obscure body but yet very powerful. Why did you run for it? Uh, actually, 
sort of by accident. I was the chief of staff to the uh, previous member of the Board of Equalization, mm -hmm. uh, Brad Sherman, who's a, a, a terrific congressman. Uh, Brad decided to run for higher office. He ran for Congress and was successful. Uh, there was a vacancy in the office. I was going to actually go into the private sector, uh, talking to people in investment management, uh, make twice as much money. But I had all these friends saying, hey, John, it's one of the 12 highest offices in the state of California. Why don't you run? You have background in taxes. You have background in politics. You can run and win in that office. And uh, ultimately, I decided to do so. And did you win easily, or what, was the, what, what happened? Well, I, I considered it a vigorous race. But when you look at the results, <laughs> we won pretty handily. And then you run for re-election? Yeah, okay. and one handily. And then state controller. We'll, we'll prompted you to run for that. Well, I had worked in the controller's office when uh, Gray Davis was the state controller, so back in uh, 1989, 1990, and Gray did incredible uh, good things uh, with that office. And so I really, really enjoyed my experience. I thought it was next step up. I could keep my portfolio of work at the Board of Equalization. Uh, Board of Equalization, as you pointed out, is one of the 82 boards and commissions that I serve on as the state controller. Mm -hmm. and then. You know, I worked with a lot of these people back in 89, 90. It's like to lead with my friends, just thinking we can do really, really terrific things for the people of California. Okay, what does the state controller do? The state controller is the state's chief fiscal officer. Uh, you outlined some of it. I, I am the state's auditor, one of the three principal auditors. I'm the state's accountant. I'm the state's cash manager, state's disbursements manager. Sit on 82 boards of authorities, including what we just discussed, the tax authority have a land use portfolio, uh, decide what happens in terms of development off the coast of California, sit on the pension authorities, sit on a whole bunch of financing authorities. Do we have affordable housing? Do we allow more additional construction here on the campus of LMU? So a great, great portfolio. So, now, you don't have time to sit on 81 boards and commissions, do you? Uh, well, I go to uh, some of them. Obviously, if there's controversial mm -hmm. issues, uh, I try to be there. But some of them run simultaneously, so you physically just can't be. So can you appoint someone to go on your behalf, or is that yeah. not allowed? So well, yeah, we, we have uh, deputies who have the authority to vote on statutory matters. If there's constitutional matters, uh, such as at the Board of Equalization, I am required to be there to vote. OK, so that every time a check is written by the state of California, it has your signature. 99% of the checks So what would be the signature. what would be the exception? Uh, the, tr the treasurer's office. On OK, all right. And so the state controller is, I mean, we've had some significant people who have held that position in the past. Uh, uh, who was your uh, immediate predecessor? Uh, Steve Wesley. OK, and he was one of the guys who started uh, what company? Uh, eBay. He started eBay, had millions of dollars, and decided to run for state controller. Then he ran for governor That's and correct. was not successful. That's um, before that was uh, Kathleen Connell. Okay, and then she was uh, another uh, very wealthy individual. Uh, and, and I forget what her business was. It was in finance or she was finance. Yeah. She, she has a doctorate in finance. Right, and then she ran for governor and was not successful. She, or she ran for mayor. Oh, well, she ran for mayor of uh, LA. She, but didn't she at one time think about running for she governor? Was. She was. She was okay. thinking of running for governor. And, and so, oh, that's right. I forgot that she ran for uh, mayor of Los Angeles. How soon? How soon we forget? So, um, so you are. Uh, because of constitutional offices are term limited. That means that you could only run for um, two terms, two four-year terms. You served your first term, you were re-elected, you're currently serving your second term. You will be termed out in 2014. That's uh, correct. What are your plans? Uh, I'm looking at state treasurer. Okay, why state treasurer? Uh, it, it aligns with what I do today. I love the financial portfolio of the state, and frankly, if we don't fix the finances of California, which is the world's ninth largest economy uh, in isolation, then we're not going to fix the major issues of the day. So let me ask you this. Given your political career, incredibly successful Board of Equalization, State Controller, and uh, as most people who uh, follow politics, probably the leading candidate to be State Treasurer, um, has being Asian American helped, uh, uh, been a hindrance or, or not played a role and is there, so that's question number one. Question number two, does it change how you govern given your background? Well, let's answer the last question first. It, it definitely changes how I govern. I mentioned how I was raised, the circumstances. So mine is, uh, I have a fundamental belief in people. Uh, and I fundament, fundamentally believe that you lift people up. And so that I frankly govern very, very differently. Uh, and it, we push transparency and mm -hmm. accountability out of the controller's office. I think we've done more aggressively than any of my predecessors posting the state's financial information. I don't want people to be blindsided by the circumstances, especially the economic circumstances of the day. Uh, they ought to be 
well prepared, understand what's coming down the bend so that they can prepare mm -hmm. their own lives uh, for it. So th that's part of it. Uh, being Asian, sometimes it helps, sometimes it's a detriment, but at the end of the day, the, uh, you know, I was raised as an American, mm -hmm. uh, Asian, Asian heritage, but uh, you know, I'm as American as you can get. Give me a scenario where, where it's helped being Asian in terms of politics. Well, uh, just you're a little bit different. Uh, so I spoke at the Democratic National Convention four years ago, uh, and part of how they highlighted me was that I was the only Asian American Democrat elected statewide in the United States of America at that time in state government. Right. But there have been other, uh, others, like the uh, governor been. of, uh, of uh, Hawaii, Washington. the governor of Washington, and, and a couple of others. But at that particular time, you were the only uh, Asian elected. Where, where, give me a scenario where it's kind of uh, hurt or been, been an imp a negative impact. Well, I've had colleagues of mine, as I run for office and you ask for your support, they <coughs> said, hey, John, a state, an Asian American can't win statewide in California. And then when you do win, do you go back to them and say, hey, I told you so? They just say the world's changing. Yeah. So, so you left the Board of Equalization and ran for um, state controller. You went state controller. Do, do, do you feel a, a, um, a responsibility to help elect who the person uh, replaces you at the Board of Equalization? Did you have a role in that? Oh, absolutely. How, I, how, did, I, how did that go? I pushed very aggressively for Judy Chu when you yeah. highlighted the, uh, the fact that we're at 1.4 to 5 uh, members of the Board of Equalization were Asian. Part of it was the, I wasn't actively involved in all their campaigns, but mm -hmm. we set the precedent. When Brad left and became a uh, United, uh, United States uh, Congressman, I got challenged. And so there was a legal challenge. So you know, I financed our, the, uh, our legal defense. And so the same thing happened when Carol Migdon left and Betty Yi mm -hmm. assumed her position. Betty didn't have to go same, through the same political and legal hurdles. Uh, that I did, so it was already well established. And then in my particular district, the fourth district, uh, I had worked with Judy Chu. Uh, I, I've known Judy for over two decades. We worked very closely. We did a lot of lifestyle tax seminars. That's one of the things that I do very differently. People bring their life experiences to the table. And I thought she was most capable to replace what I had done, and frankly, she would fulfill the con uh, and continue the programs that I had implemented. And she so, had political experience, having previously been on the state assembly and on the Monterey um, City Council. And right. school district. And school district, that's right. <laughs> but what was, the, was there any, um, in terms of you doing that and, and saying, supporting Judy Chu, irrespective of how qualified she was, um, was there some uh, uh, feedback and, and negativity in terms of an Asian supporting another Asian for a particular position? Not in my case, because in other instances I had supported Caucasians over Asian candidates. So. Uh, as I pointed out, some of a lot of this is your relationships. Who have you worked with? Who do you trust? Uh, and that's the great thing, I think, about the opportunities of mm -hmm. America. Uh, we will one day get past just as Martin Luther King, as one of my heroes, right? Your, the, skin, the color of your skin, and we'll look at the content of the character. So you're going to run for state treasurer. Okay, you're the leading candidate by all accounts. Uh, um, are you going to play a role in trying to see who's going to be the next state controller? Uh, I may or may not. We will see. What does that mean? I mean, are you, well, it depends on it depends on who the candidates that are lining up to run for office. Oh, so, okay, so it hasn't so, been clear who's declared or or, or who hasn't. Yeah, if, um, you, if you have you know a, 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 a huge platform with uh, wonderfully qualified candidates, uh, then I might not I might not feel compelled to interject. So let me give you a scenario. Um, we all know that uh, Governor Brown is getting up there in years. He's uh, served uh, two terms previously. Now he's serving third term, but not consecutive. He's allowed by uh, the Constitution to run for one more term in 2014. But he decides he's had enough, and he decides uh, not to run for governor. Uh, would you run for governor? Uh, we, I'd look at it. Well, and, and what would you look at? What would be the factors that would lead you to say, yes, I'm going to run, or not, I'm, go I'm not going to run? What, what, what do you look at first? Besides asking permission from your wife, what would be the second thing that you would do? Uh, that's basically it. You check with your wife. <laughs> and then what, what does she look at before she says yes? Uh, but, uh, no, no, my wife's always uh, incredibly supportive. Uh, I, I look at the vision and portfolio and experience as to who could offer. Uh, the, uh, I, I just think we offer a re wonderfully powerful and, and encouraging portfolio uh, with what we've done. 
And so as long as this state's in financial crisis, I think I have a lot to add. Well, let's talk about the financial crisis. I mean, you've been in elected office for a while. You've seen a lot of what has changed. Um, we've talked about California, the economy. Um, obviously, this national election that we're in was uh, in part supposed to be about the economy. Somehow that hasn't really transpired to, uh, to some extent. But we clearly understand that we're in a great recession and that California has had its share of problems. Um, when you describe the two or three most important challenges to the state of California, what would those be? Well, number one, out of my shop, cash management. Uh, it's hard to imagine that California, with a 1.9 trillion state domestic product, has been operating in cash deficit since July 13, 2007. Okay, but one point, that amount though is not the not the uh, state government, but it's no. the it's the California Econ economy. Right, the economic uh, output at the private of, sector. Of, 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 right, private and public sector. Okay. And so, uh, it, it, actually, that's one of the big drags, both for the national and state economy. It's the uh, the contraction of uh, of government. And but when you take a look at that, uh, it. As bad as California is, and we constantly hear about it in, in, on the, in the press, from the LA Times, Sacramento Bee, you name it, they're, they're talking about it. Is it that bad? Is it, is it, do you see the, the challenge as, as, um, as large as, as being portrayed in the press? Well, it is a formidable challenge. Uh, so just imagine the California budget being your family household budget. So imagine that you've been operating on borrowing from your mom, your dad, your brother and sister since July 13th, plus nearly uh, borrowing on and really testing the limits on your credit card. So it is very difficult. So who's been talking to you about me? It's like, uh, how, how did you know I've been having those that's issues? Not you. Know? We know that's not you. But, uh, okay, but given the, the that you do that because there are programs that we just don't want to cut. You're a Democrat. The governor's a Democrat. The state legislature's democratic. Un unlike the federal government, you know there there is a large Democratic dominant governing majority here, and, and it's really on them in terms of being able to put together a plan to get us out of this. Um, what what's your part in that plan? Well, that's partially correct, right? The voters in, of California uh, in 20, November 2010 passed Proposition 25, mm -hmm. which allowed the legislature to pass a budget by majority vote. Correct. If you remember prior to that, it was two-thirds to pass a budget. So actually, you needed both Democrats and Republicans to pass a budget, and it would be the few last legislators who basically would hold up the entire process. So they would get what they want, and frankly, we have a lot of bad public policy because we would, the budget would be held out until you made them very, very happy. Uh, and so that's part of the, that's part of the challenge today. The, the Democrats are working hard to reduce a lot of the expenditures. Frankly, all of us have to think about how we redesign government for the 21st century. Uh, the things that have really creeped up over the past few decades are correctional costs and the cost of borrowing. So how are we more efficient with incarceration? How are we more cost efficient as to prioritizing, prioritizing the state's debt and reducing the cost of those the debt service. So it's the absolute in terms of the state's debt because in terms of uh, the interest rates, it's lower than it's ever been before, but we've been borrowing so much that it's taking a higher percentage of our budget to pay off the, the, those bonds that we, we've borrowed. Um, That's exactly correct. So if you're looking a few decades ago, of the state budget, 3% was for debt service decades ago. Five years ago, it's about 4.7%. Before they actually passed the budget, the debt affordability had it at 7.8% for last year. And if we continue our current path, we're looking at over 10% for next decade. You don't want to be spending 10% of your household budget on interest okay, payments. Okay, so what's the solution? I mean, we know what the challenges are. The state's spending more than it's taking in. There are programs that we just have to continue to fund. Um, we, we know, and we'll talk about the, uh, the, the pension issues that just continue to uh, explode. What's the solution to these problems? And what would you, as a state treasurer, do it to help uh, realize those solutions? Well, we're going to do, have to do a lot of things. First, we're going to have to increase revenues, and this is very general, then I'll get more specific. A tax increase. We're going to increase revenues. We're going to have to cut spending. Mm -hmm. We're going to have to use things more efficiently. We're going to have to reorganize government. And then most importantly, we're going to have to grow the economy. So let me give you an example. One of the things that is ballooning out of control for both the United States and the state of California is healthcare costs. Mm -hmm. So one of the things I targeted is I'm examining how much all of us, the taxpayers of California, are paying for some of the premiums that we charge to, for seniors' healthcare. So Ellen Lowenthal referred a company to my office, 
Alan we, Lowenthal is a state senator. From Long Beach, a terrific state senator. He, uh, after, after he referred it to us, we audited that company. We identified that they were charging all of us over 80% profit on the premiums they were charging to the state of California. I had the California healthcare negotiators renegotiate that contract. Today, that company makes 4 to 5% profit. For the four-year contract that they signed, we just saved $352 million over a four-year period of time. And then if you read the LA Times from about three weeks ago, both the United States Attorney and State Attorney General's Office, after we passed that paperwork on, got back some of those monies for past profits. So that one audit is about 500 plus million dollars. And so my six years as controller, we've been the most successful auditor in California history. We've identified $3 billion in abuse, waste, fraud, and inefficiencies. And, and when you're talking about three, those are real dollars that were then saved. Uh, not all of them have been saved, but we identified it. The, we don't get to do the, we can follow up, but we don't, we're, we're not the agency in charge. So we need leadership out of those, the agency heads and others to make sure that we actually, uh, we actually recognize and get those savings. But, but, okay, so let's go back when we start talking about solutions. We talked about revenue enhancement uh, in terms of then, then cutting some budgets and then being more efficient, et cetera. In terms of revenue enhancements, on the ballot in November, statewide, there will be Proposition 30, which is proposed by uh, Governor Brown, which will increase income taxes on a certain segment of the population. There's also Proposition, I believe, 38, is that right, with, uh, from being sponsored by Molly Munger, that, that also uh, raises taxes. What's your position on, on those two? So there's three tax measures. There's uh, the governor's, there's Molly Munger's, uh, there's also one that Tom Steyer is proposing. Uh, Tom takes on an issue that recognizes a fundamental failing in our legislative process. California today uh, is attacked because they say, well, we're not business friendly. And in part, you'll see governors from other states coming into California mm -hmm. saying, we're stealing your businesses. Well, we designed a tax system that fundamentally penalizes California corporations for hiring people in California and for owning property in California. We're doing this to ourselves. Okay, wait a minute, how does that work? So, yeah. it's, so it, you're, you're saying that the state of California uh, charges a higher tax if you're an in-state uh, corporation than instead of an out-of-state corporation doing work in California. Yeah, it gets... Like, like an example, it, uh, comparing two companies, one out, uh, out of California, one in California. What would be an example? Yeah, that? I was trying to avoid getting overly complicated, but it's our corporate tax apportionment mm -hmm. methodology. So up until we changed it a few years ago, we would double weight the sales factor, how many sales take place in, inside the state of California versus outside the state of California. We would look at the payroll factor, how many people are employed in California versus outside of the state of California. And we look at the property factor, how much of your property is in California versus out of California. So the incentive, if you want to reduce California taxes, is to create a smaller numerator, have less activity in the state of California, have activity outside of the state of California. So that's so, what we the, do. The idea would be, though, in that, for, in that methodology that was used, that if you had more property, more sales, et cetera, in California, you were using more California resources, roads, schools, et cetera, and that you should pay a higher tax. I'm assuming that's what the rationale was for. Well, actually, we created it because actually at the beginning when they created this, some multinational corporations wanted to come into California. So it might have made sense in a small fraction to do that, but now we're trying to keep businesses in, in the state of California. We're trying to grow business in the state of California. We're also in the 21st century in a very different economy. Uh, we have to realize that today the United States is 23% of the world's gross domestic product uh, in our lifetime, mm -hmm. uh, because we're a little bit older. We were once the sole military and economic superpower with the United States being 40% of the world's GDP. We're gonna have to change with the times, and we're not doing a good job. Okay, so you talked about um, three tax measures on, on the ballot. This one, how, how, are you supporting this tax, uh, this uh, ballot measure? I, I am. The, uh, the, the choice is this. Uh, I would, in the absence of fundamentally rechanging our tax structure, and f we can't change it quick enough, but I'd like to change the entire tax structure, I don't believe we should be cutting education potentially 15 days for K through 12. Uh, we have kids in a 
schools today for about 175 days. If the tax measure fails, we're looking at about 160 days. Okay, we're talking about, what's the proposition on this one? That, that, that well, this, the governor's initiative is um, 30. Okay, but you, you said there was, there was three. The governor's, Molly Mongers, and then the third one. That, that would change that corporate tax apportionment right, methodology right. But, that I mentioned. All right, but that third one actually reduces taxes in the state of California, does it not? No, over the long term, it, it should increase because we would have greater activity in the state of but California. But in the short term, it would reduce taxes. Uh, the, we don't know how it nets out. Okay. But in that third one, are you in, what, uh, are you in favor of that one? Uh, I, I haven't taken an official position, but policy-wise, I like what it's, where okay. it's headed. Now, so that's, that, that's one initiative. The second one is that we're talking about is the governor's initiative, Proposition 30. Are you in favor of that one? I am. Okay. And, and what, what does that one do? Let, tell the uh, students what that does. So it increases the sales tax by quarter of a penny for four years. It increases uh, income taxes over seven years for a, depending on how much you earn. Okay, now I always thought that um, you were only supposed to have one issue per proposition. It, this proposition seems to deal with two things. One is the sales tax and the other is the income tax. How do, how do they get away with that? Why, why didn't the uh, law force the governor to have two or three different initiatives? Well, the, uh, it's the single subject rule that right. you're referencing, right? So I think they're just talking about taxes. So I think and so that's very, taxes. very that's very broad. Okay, and you're in favor of that? I am. Okay, uh, Molly Mongers, uh, uh, Proposition 38. So the uh, she has uh, it's more inclusive, ex includes mm -hmm. more people, and who would be subject to income taxes. And you're in favor of that? Uh, the I'm open. I let people choose. You know, the uh, I, I'm generally in favor of propositions that help the educational component of California. And are there any other initiatives that you have some interest in that, you, that you've endorsed uh, on the ballot in November? Uh, no on 32. No on 32. Tell the students about the, the, uh, Proposition 32, who it was sponsored by, what it does, and why you are against it. Well, it's, uh, No on 32 would limit people's political participation. Obviously, it, it changes the way people can make contributions and participate in the political process. But it's focused really on unions. Uh, the right? uh, direct objective by some of the authors was to limit the ability of working people to participate. Right. As I understand it, um, what Proposition 32 does is right now, um, if you are a member of the, of the union, a portion of your dues uh, can be used for political activity and for the unions to advocate on their behalf, either directly lobbying or even uh, contributing to elections. Um, obviously, there are um, other interests, mostly business interests, that don't like that and they feel that unions are way too powerful and that they've dictated the agenda in California and in Los Angeles. And so they've put this initiative out there to prevent the dues of union members going to political activity. And then they, they believe that that would uh, um, even the, the, um, the playing field. Um, which leads us to the position of um, pensions and, and unions and the whole uh, uh, um, situation that we're in that many have described as unsustainable. So. Um, Going to the pensions, you sit on CalPERS and CalSTRS. First, CalPERS, explain to the students what CalPERS is, what it does, and, and what it's supposed to, um, how it's supposed to function. I'll get to that, but let me add one additional point. Our democracy is very uh, delicate. On uh, Proposition 32. Uh, on, on, on the prop, yeah, the, it, well, just America's mm -hmm. politics. Mm -hmm. uh, we need a hefty debate and democracy on both sides. Uh, so I belong to one particular party. I have a, a, a set of values and philosophy, but I don't want to disarm the other side because if you have too much power aggregated in one side, mm -hmm. we're not going to have a healthy functional democracy. So I don't believe that you should try to unilaterally disarm one other side. Uh, we, need, we need balance in the process. And frankly, you're absolutely correct. If you have one side that's too powerful, Right. We're headed off the fiscal cliff uh, right. in America. Now, I sit on CalPERS. Calper, CalPERS is the largest public pension plan in the United States of America. We have assets uh, of about $240, million, uh, $240 billion. Dollars in That's our with a V, $240 billion. Right, and so we have uh, our, the, our membership includes state employees, mm -hmm. local agency employees, uh, school employees outside of uh, teachers, uh, and so we have a defined benefit plan. Uh, for those who aren't familiar, it is once you retire, you know that you're going to get a fixed Excellent. benefit right. over a period of time. Right. And so the, the, the theory has always been, as I've understood it, that for you to be a government employee, you typically get paid less 
than you would in the private sector, sometimes doing the same thing. So for instance, as an accountant, and you're an accountant and you go work for the Board of Equalization or the controller or somebody else, and you have the same degree, the same education, and then an accountant goes and works for the private sector, KPMG or what have you, that that accountant that goes to work for the private sector is gonna get paid more, okay? However, the, the guy or gal who goes and works for government, it's gonna, they're gonna get paid less, but they're also um, gonna uh, be, that's gonna be made up in terms of certain quality of life issues. Typically working only nine to five, sometimes a little bit more, but never the crazy hours that uh, some accounting firm would have you do. But also that you're gonna have a defined uh, um, benefit, meaning that you will know after you retire that you'll have X amount of dollars mm -hmm. uh, when the private sector doesn't get that. That that's the payoff, that for government to compete with the private sector for uh, employees, they can't afford the salary, so they make it up in benefits. Do you understand it the same way I do? And, and do you uh, agree with that and, and, and want, want to supplement that? Well, I, I thought you hit on a key point. Uh, that's the understanding perhaps now. That wasn't the understanding before, because if you looked at the private sector, at one point there were over 120,000 private sector defined benefit plans. But as the economy has changed, you know, that has dropped very, very quickly. And that's dropped very quickly over the last two decades. So the, 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 uh, the theory has changed. So there, but, but you understand how taxpayers feel that they're like, look, nobody in the, well not, very few in the private sector get a defined benefit, a set amount. All of us, like myself included here at Loyola Marymount University, the university contributes to my um, retirement but they don't guarantee it. They're saying, here's an X amount uh, on this month, and then you choose how it gets to be invested, and if you make a lot of money from that, great. If you don't, we're not gonna make up for it. But at, in the public sector, it's guaranteed whether or not CalPERS makes that. Right now, CalPERS is not making enough. This is the board that you sit on. With, even though it has $240 billion, it's not making enough to be able to pay all the benefits that we know are gonna happen. What's the solution to that? Yeah, so there's a lot of things uh, that can happen. Uh, just a decade ago, or technically 12 years ago, uh, CalPERS in terms of its state portfolio was 100% funded. Uh, so was CalSTRS. Now, Th that means that no matter how you figured it out, it had enough money to pay for all the retirees when, when they retire. Over uh, doing the actuarial okay. calculation over a 30 year period of time. Uh, then, then we hit a rough, rough spot. One of the things we have to do is try to come up with a reasonable compensation package for state employees. Uh, people make the adjustments. When I first got to the Board of Equalization, and a few years later, we were losing state employees to the private sector, and you referenced accountants. We could not keep middle management at the Board of Equalization because you would make $45,000 as a state employee, and one of the you know, back then big six would be paying them $80,000, right? So you would try to, try to keep them with healthcare benefits, those types of pension benefits. So what we need something is sustainable that makes sense to both those who dis choose public service as a career and those in the private sector in good times and bad times, this is a reasonable compensation package, right? When you view things in the extremes, when the economy's hot or when the economy's terrible, right, it throws everything out of whack. Well, there's two things, not only is the economy terrible and, the, and, and uh, taxpayers are saying, hey, we don't get that. But then you get these stories like Bell Gardens or others and this whole what they call spiking um, that show an abuse of the system where you have um, the police chief uh, at uh, Bell Gardens who I think only worked there for three or four years is now getting a pension of you know, half a million dollars, $500,000. And when people read that, they say this system is is out of whack. Explain to the students what spiking is and how it works and how it's impacted uh, CalPERS and CalSTRS. So pension spiking is when you have an individual get from the particular jurisdiction that employs them a massive benefit at the end of their career so that you can drive up what their retirement benefits are gonna mm -hmm. be. Now you just referenced the police chief of Bell. Uh, right as we read the paper today, he's in a court of law being contested as to whether those are legal retirement benefits or not. In addition, uh, you might have read a couple of weeks ago, I released a pension spiking audit. Mm -hmm. The good thing is that going forward, we're gonna cap those instances of pension spiking. There has been a change of law uh, so that those egregious practices and other egregious practices need to be thrown out, never to be seen again. 
So just to be more clear in terms of spiking, let's go back to your accountant at the Board of Equalization. He starts off making 45000 maybe toward the end of his career, after 20, 25, 30 years, he's making like 90, 100000 which makes sense, okay? Right before he retires, he gets a, a, a raise that's not going to cost that department much, let's say 20000 120000 even though for a little while, and then the retirement would be based on the 120, not the 100. Is that the way it works? In, in the old year, you could be, it's far more complex than that. So the Let's say he's making 100 until the last year you would do, and he makes 120,000. Uh, so the calculation is how many years of services he would get uh, times what his benefit formula is uh, and what his highest salary was. Now they changed it from one year to now three, three years. years. And so it has to be over a 36 month period of time. Yeah. So that would reduce that power of that one year spike. In addition, you wouldn't have the $120,000 uh, because I, I sit on those authorities. Mm -hmm. So unless you are the, you're the executive of that division, mm -hmm. right, then you get that. And so you have se serious responsibility uh, position, uh, work in those positions. But however the technicalities work, spiking is really gaming the system for the benefit of, of a few. Right. Now, one of the realities is that the vast majority of retirees don't spike the system. The vast majority of retirees aren't getting you know, forget 500,000, they're not even getting 100 or 90,000. The, what's the average retiree from CalPERS or CalSTRS receiving right now? Okay, so it's, it's gonna increase, but we have to understand teachers in California don't get Social Security. So their pension plan is everything they have unless they're independently wealthy. They also, in many instances, don't get health care. So up until a few years ago, if you worked in the system 22, 23 years, your, your take home was about $2,300 a month. I think that people would view that as fair. So right. most of the people are in a position where their people would view it as fair comp compensation for the years that they put in, especially teaching is more difficult today uh, than it was uh, decades ago. However, as you pointed out, and very powerfully so, that those pension spiking cases drew the headlines mm -hmm. and that had to be terminated because that wasn't reflective and that shouldn't be reflective of how our defined benefits plan system ought to work. Well, tell the students about what the governor and the legislature have done in terms of preventing that from happening. So the governor and legislature recently passed uh, and signed Meaning a... Meaning this session, it just this literally just, just happened. A few weeks ago. Right. So that eliminated tension spiking. Uh, it prevented retroactive pay increases. Uh, so for instance, you could work and then they would, might say, we're going to go back these past years and calculate it and increase your pay. Uh, it eliminated airtime. So for some people, you didn't have to work, but you bought in the value of those years of working, and then they would provide for investment returns. And so those were some of the major reforms. They also capped how much you would calculate from your salary would ca be calculated as to what would be in your final uh, compensation mm -hmm. package. So what, irrespective of that change, um, the state's in trouble because, I mean, CalPERS is not going to make what it needs to make to sustain the retirees is that, as we currently have it. Is that correct? Uh, well, the, well, that's the big question, right? Right now it doesn't look good because everybody's pretty but depressed about the economy. You should know whether it's going to happen or not. Well, right. no, no, nobody knows it unless you're God okay. uh, because nobody, nobody, Those, can, the no, returns. nobody can predict the returns, right? The, the, if, if you could predict the returns, this person would have all the wealth of the world uh, because we don't know what the stock market's going to do 30 years from now, mm -hmm. more or less what's the stock market's going to do tomorrow. Right. right. So what you do is you try to look at histori history, you try to look at what's happening with current conditions, and you try to get within a range. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, we could be, f our chance of being 100% funded are 25%, where you get a good few years, and it may be created crazily. Right now, the interest rates are held arbitrarily low, but what if you have massive inflation, and it drives all the prices up? So instead of fixed income today being at 1%, fixed income suddenly becomes 10%. And then our, our discount rate, right, I'm trying to think about how not to use technical terms, but our discount rate is 7.5%. But if you, you have fixed income returns, which is the safety portion of your portfolio, over 7.5%, you can get okay. there. But irrespective of all the numbers and percentages, if things continue the way they have the last five years, there's no way that the state can pay its retirees. There's no way that the city of Los Angeles, which is not part of the state retiree system, it has its own, that it would have a, a problem. 
And, and, and so what, assuming that happens, that things don't change dramatically, um, that the, the um, chief administrative officer of the city of Los Angeles says that we will, the city will literally run out of money to be able to pay for any other service other than retirement. So they can pay for people who used to work at the city, but they can't pay for people to currently work at the city. Right. Um, what's what's the, the most basic solution to that other than changing the, the uh, defined uh, benefit to a, a defined contribution? Short of doing that, are there, is there any other silver bullet? Well, I think you have to be careful on what, what the last point you just mm. made. If you switch from defined benefit mm. to defined contribution, basically you, just, you might have drastically increased the unfundability of that defined benefit plan, making things worse, right? Because part of the calculation has to be how much people are contributing mm -hmm. plus the investment return to get to where you need to be for defined benefits. So people say strictly move defined benefit to defined contribution, be careful. We gotta be smart about that. Uh, people are gonna have to make f further uh, conciliations. Mm -hmm. They're gonna have to come to further agreement. So a lot of the plans have made adjustments going forward for future employees. So, I mean, so in other words, the students who are here and they're gonna graduate, they won't get those benefits? They, they will, well, under the current methodology, you will get the benefits, but you will have a different compensation package, including mm -hmm. retirement, different than what the current employees have. Right. So the current employee may be accruing at 2.3%, uh, a, a student here, once they go into appointment, may be accruing at 2.1 percent, right. and, and, and that does make a difference. What has to happen is uh, agreement by the employees and the employers as to what current concessions they're willing to give, right? Because we have agreement going forward, but we don't have agreement as to what changes need to take place for current employees, and that depends on a legal case. Right. Right. Um, while the state is in one situation, there are many cities that are having difficult times, and we've already seen three or four cities go bankrupt, which is kind of hard to conceive how a city can go bankrupt, but they can. But by law, the state of California cannot go bankrupt, so when people talk about California going bankrupt, from a technical perspective, that, that cannot happen. Right. Well, now, why is that? 1937 bankruptcy law. So the, when they created bankruptcy in 1937. Which is a federal law. Federal law, right, federal provisions. They allowed for, uh, municipal jurisdictions and others, businesses, but not the state. Not, or any state, any of the 50 no, states, right? None, none of the 50 states. Right. But what's causing these bankruptcies in the, in the state of California? Well, they're different for different instances. For, uh, so you had Vallejo a couple years ago, mm -hmm. and part of it is that the city council basically farmed out their responsibility to arbitration panels, right? And so it didn't have the same political sensitivity as to coming to agreement to resolve the financial challenges implicating that city. Stockton mm -hmm. engaged in massive development projects uh, at a bad, uh, they had bad timing. Uh, Mammoth Lakes uh, also was going to engage in a big project. Uh, the project was declared illegal to perform, and so they, uh, they weren't able to make their debt payments to the developer that they were working on. San Bernardino has a whole host of issues. Part of it was the development issues, and certainly part of it is the cost issues. So, so it's, you have to look at jurisdiction by jurisdiction to see what's happening underlying with financial issues. It's sort of like talking about people in the United States. How did they get into financial trouble? Well, one family may be different than another family. Do you foresee any more bankruptcies in the state of California? Well, we have tremendous uh, financial issues that have huge implications for cities and counties throughout the state of California, and they're gonna be different. So redevelopment agencies, mm -hmm. uh, the legislature uh, and governor just took action to eliminate the redevelopment agencies. Some of the cities had been borrowing improperly from redevelopment agencies, so we'll see how clean their finances are now. Uh, I'm not saying at all that these cities are gonna go bankrupt, but uh, the legislature uh, just took away some money from four cities in the Inland Empire took away the vehicle license fee. Mm -hmm. And so that's gonna severely impact their calculations. So it will create additional financial pressures, but not necessarily cause bankruptcy. You hear May former Mayor Reardon from the city of Los Angeles constantly talking about the city of Los Angeles going bankrupt. Do you believe that's gonna happen? Uh, well, bankruptcy is a political calculation. Mm -hmm. uh, I would not encourage any city to file for bankruptcy. Hopefully they can get their parties to be intelligent because Nothing against a lawyer, because I'm a lawyer, mm -hmm. but when you file for bankruptcy, you just send a huge chunk of your money to the lawyers to resolve these issues. And in Vallejo, where it's millions of dollars and it's a smaller city, 
they could have used those monies for fire services, they could have used those money to pay down debt instead of giving it to lawyers. So we've been talking about all kinds of different issues, um, in including the, the Great Recession, we started with that, and certainly it's impacted California dramatically. We've talked about raising taxes through the initiative process, we've talked about the uh, role that uh, both CalPERS and CalSERS and city, city retirement systems have on that. Um, also, one of the um, major changes that occurred this year in California, and you briefly mentioned it, was the abolishment of redevelopment. Many cities are in trouble for a variety of different reasons, just like the nation and the state, so are cities. Uh, and they used redevelopment for all kinds of different purposes, but really they, they felt that it was a, an engine of growth. And the governor felt that it was inappropriate how those taxes or tax increment was being used and abolished them so that other jurisdictions can then pick up those taxes. They didn't abolish the taxes. They just abolished that the taxes don't go to redevelopment agencies in the future. They will go to cities, school districts, the county, et cetera. Um, two questions. Do you agree with the governor in terms of abolishing redevelopment? Would you have done it differently? And then uh, second, um, what is the role of the state controller in the abolishment and, and uh, um, following up in terms of what redevelopment agencies uh, do? So do you agree with the governor? So what they did was actually they used the took away the redevelopments created through tax increment. Right. Uh, and so I think the system's fundamentally broken. Uh, when we did a review after the governor proposed eliminating RDAs, and you have to understand the governor wasn't trying to eliminate all the RDAs. What he was trying to do was get RDAs. RDA is redevelopment agencies. agency. He, governor was trying to get the redevelopment agencies actually to make some contributions to education. Mm -hmm. uh, now the cities and the RDAs didn't like doing any of that, so they challenged the governor and his authority in court. They lost. So instead of having to give some of the money back, they basically played the political game, went for the grand slam, and struck out. Uh, and that's, uh, that's unfortunate in many instances. It leads to a more fundamental problem. So how do we create economic development in local jurisdictions, mm -hmm. right? You can come back with some version, smaller version, limited version, of RDAs, right? Because some of the RDAs, frankly, the monies were used improperly. When I did a review, one of the Inland Empire cities used RDA money to upgrade a four and a half star golf resort. The city of Coronado, their whole area, it, it's a mo beautiful area, multi-million dollar property. That's that, that island that, city right off of San, San Diego. Diego. That entire area is a redevelopment agency. Now remember that you can only have a redevelopment agency where uh, the place is blighted by definition. So, and so it's hard to think of Coronado Island as blighted. Right, so they would have very liberal interpretations of blighted. Some people would define undeveloped area as blighted. Some people would define as a crack on a sidewalk as blighted. So you would overspend. And that was what our review identified. It wasn't, it's not, I don't say audit because it's not technically meet the audit standards. We did a review. One of the things we have to do in the 21st century is we have to redesign California's tax structure to compete in the 21st century, including what is the dedicated financing stream for locally generated activities and services. And so that ought to be a state discussion. Yeah. We are at Loyola Marymount University having a uh, broad ranging discussion with State Controller John Chung about the state, about uh, all kinds of different political issues. Um, I'm going to ask if any students have questions, especially those that want extra credit on their uh, uh, papers or midterms, so we can uh, uh, have, a, have you come up to the microphone. And uh, please don't all rush up there. There's plenty of time for you to uh, ask a question. So if I say brilliant question, do they get more points? Um, well, we'll <laughs> depend. We'll, we'll see. State control chairman, I'm John, African American studies major. You alluded to the fact that um, when Dr. Gear asked you the question about a sustainability uh, as it regards the pension system, and you uh, basically talked about the fact that there's no way to tell whether or not payments will be um, covered in the near future. I mean, uh, one of the questions, I have two questions. First of all, isn't that seem to be indicative of a problem that the state governments have, that they, on one hand, say that there's no way to forecast or predict how um, the market or anything will, will survive or anything, but they do that in the process of the negotiation for contracts? And secondly, um, Professor Gere has often talked to us about Proposition 13, and the possibility of overturning of that. Um, the question is, based upon the, the 
and adequacy of the way that the current system is set up as far as pensions and other problems dealing fiscally with the state of California. Will Proposition 13 and its elimination really do anything else than provide more monies to the bill system? Uh, so I think, I think those are terrific questions. Actually, it's difficult to comprehend the, the, the obligation in any over the long period of time, mm -hmm. but that doesn't mean you don't take solid action, right? You have a sense of what your funding ratio is, and clearly, as you get into more problem areas, and even before you get mm -hmm. into problem areas, you have to make tough, difficult decisions to make sure that you're closer to 100% funded. Uh, so it doesn't, even though it's difficult to calculate because the vagaries of the market, right. you still have to take action so that you're sustainable. So what actions have been taken by CalPERS and CalSTRS recently? Well, it's the legislature okay. uh, requires it. And then in addition, part of it, and we provide the information so that the legislature has a sense of what their action would do uh, to the plan over, over a certain period of time. Uh, in, in addition, we reduce the discount rate. Part of the challenge is what's your expected rate of return, which is pretty close to what the discount rate is. We use the same numbers for, for both. And so as you reduce the discount rate, you're taking out of the risk of the system, but you're also, out of the pension system, you may increase risk for the employer, but you're also making sure that you have greater employee and employer contributions so you have more soundness in the system. Proposition 13, I've heard Mayor Antonio Villaraigosa uh, pretty aggressively in the last couple of years saying that we have to take on Proposition 13 and actually change it. And it's been known as the third rail of California politics that any elected official who touches it is going to be defeated. Now, of course, he only touched it because he's not running for re-election. Uh, you are still a very much a viable political um, player. Um, do you agree with him that Proposition 13 needs to be uh, taken a look at it and maybe reformed? Yeah, I think we take a look at Proposition 13 as we look at the entire tax structure everything ought to be tied together because you want to look at how California, as I pointed out, is competitive. Mm -hmm. So what are the thriving economies, what type of tax structure, whether, and the, th the three major legs of tax are income taxes, sales taxes, and property taxes. Mm -hmm. Now those aren't all state tax sources, right? We'd split that between the state for the first two and property taxes for the third. So we may want to look at particular adjustments to make California competitive, see how it impacts an individual, how it impacts a business in, uh, going forward. So explain to the students Proposition 13. Many of us who are been involved in politics a long time, we always talk about Pro Proposition 13 and just assume that everybody knows of, about it. Uh, most of these students were born in 1992, 93, 94. Proposition 13 was passed in 1978, which is ancient history to some of them. Right, they weren't um, alive. They were, they were not, some of their parents may not have been alive. Um, what, uh, what is Proposition 13? So Prop Proposition 13 was a uh, initiative that the voters of California passed, as you pointed out, in 1978. It dealt with property taxes. So in property taxes, you purchase property and you have a base year value as, as to how much a property may be. So let's say the property is worth $100. That's your base year value. But actually, Proposition 13 rolled back the base year value to 1975, so that was your first year. Now, house can go up or down in value, but as to its assessed value, how much you would look at, the, what number you would look at to assess it, Proposition, limited, Proposition 13 limited the annual increase to 2%. So let's say your property worth $100, year two went to $200. However, for taxing purposes, you would only tax on $102, a 2% increase. It has a general levy, meaning the basic general tax of 1%. There can be special levies, right? You could have a lighting district, a mosquito abatement district, some other district. Have to approve that. The, uh, but you, you have a general levy and a special levy, and so that's what Proposition 13. It basically capped how much the increase in the annual assessment could, uh, could could increase by. It basically separated market value from assessed value. That's Whereas correct. Before they used to be the same. Now you can have a house worth a million bucks, but it's really assessed at 100,000 or 200,000, depending on when it entered the, the tax system. That's right. right. With, with that, that's with that right. particular and, owner. And so that's the upside. I didn't talk about the downside. We'll save time. Yeah, but well, but I mean, do you agree with uh, Mayor Viragosa that, that, I mean, he, go, he goes uh, um, to the point where he's saying it should be overturned. Um, if there was a proposition on the ballot to overturn Proposition 13, would you be supportive of that? 
not in the absence of changes to other part of the tax system, right? Because we have a delicate balance between how we try to create businesses, how we want individuals to do well here in California. So the, I don't believe in working on one tax in isolation. Mm -hmm. Okay. So. Yeah. Good evening, State and Troy. Um, thank you for being with us tonight. Thank you. Um, It will have a profoundly dislocating impact. Uh, of those redevelopment agencies, there is a 20% set aside uh, for uh, low mod affordable housing. What, what, what that means is that of all the money that redevelopment, redevelopment agencies collected, they had to spend 20% of it on the building of housing. Of, correct? Uh, affordable, right. uh, affordable, yeah, affordable. Low mod affordable housing. So one of the things that we need to go forward as they were talking about alternative definitions or alternative uh, operations uh, instead of the pre-existing redevelopment agencies. They're talking about uh, strictly defining blight and creating a pot of money for uh, low-income housing. So, what, okay, if redevelopment agencies no longer exist, and really it was the only agencies doing that kind of work, who will pick, up, who will pick that up? Cities don't have money, so how is how's that going to work? or we just get government out of doing anything like that? We're gonna see uh, how the market reacts. I mean, but that, that's, I mean, leave, okay, the market is not going to produce housing for poor people, I don't believe. It never has and it never will, and that's just my, my opinion. And if, if that's the case, we need government to step in and assist in that area. We had a vehicle, redevelopment agencies, do you foresee any new vehicle, any new law, any new approach that would allow government to create incentives or to push the market in terms of uh, building uh, low to moderate uh, housing? Well, if the economy turns around more robustly so that there's additional monies in the state system, I believe they will create the next permutation of redevelopment agency to provide some type of financing vehicle for affordable housing. So um, the student mentioned that she's a major in urban studies. When you take a look at the current national election for president, um, it's almost as though cities don't exist. Obviously, the majority of voters live in cities, suburbs, and rural areas, but mostly in suburbs and rural areas, but a good portion live in cities. There seems to be no urban agenda or urban strategy in, in either one of the campaigns. Um, does that surprise you? Uh, I, I think there is, a, there is an urban agenda that's not at the forefront, right? The people, elected candidates will talk about what they've done, what they're proposing, but obviously you're polling to the people who are undecided. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe in this particular instance, the people are playing to their bases. So there are a lot of messages, mixed messages that with the way you have communication today that are specifically targeted. Mm -hmm. What has surprised you most about the national election so far? Uh, the lack of substantive solutions uh, to, the, to the economic issues uh, facing America today. So how would you define those issues the, the, that, that America is facing? Uh, 21st century employment, 21st century education, new financing mechanisms for upgrading America's infrastructure, how do we fix uh, the financial sector of the economy? So you're saying that neither President Obama nor Governor Romney are addressing this. What is no, it? I, I think they're talking about it, but the, uh, you don't have a, maybe we will have it when you get to the debates, but probably not. But, so then what is it about American politics that prevents really substantive issues from being discussed? I mean, the issues that you just talked about to me seem to be the important ones, and yet we don't have that discussion, and neither campaign or neither candidate feel that they can even afford to talk about that because it'll get lost, it won't be picked up. What, what, what's going on in American politics that we can't have a substantive discussion? Too complicated. 
the issues uh, that we, we discussed a little bit earlier, and I brought up California's corporate tax apportionment yeah, method I, methodology. I, I didn't get that one. But right? And yeah. you're, you're incredibly intelligent, yeah. right? But people operate in their own worlds. They operate in their silos. And imagine I say corporate tax apportionment methodology as a serious candidate for any office or the, uh, another California politician talks about it. You just lost the attention of a whole bunch of people. But it is something that needs to be addressed. So, you know, we constantly hear that the system is broken in Washington, D.C., that there's just stalemate and, and it's just difficult to get anything done. Um, to some extent, even in, in Sacramento, we've, we've heard that. And uh, oftentimes, someone uh, in Washington or a national commentator says, well, if the Democrats or the Republicans had control of all three, or, well, the two branches of government, meaning the presidency and the legislature, but the two houses in the, in the, in the uh, legislature, both the Senate and, and the House, that they would be able to get something done. Um, do you believe that would happen? No, I think it depends on the individual elected officials. Uh, do you have the courage to stand up against the special interests, the people who fund your base, who get out and mm -hmm. walk precincts on issues of common interest to the American people or here in but California. John, they, they, they don't. I mean, collectively, uh, I mean, but, individually, but we need, yeah, I know, but individually we need, every time I meet an elected official, I'm always impressed about their community service, what they're saying, what their background is, their ideas and all that, individually. But collectively, I mean, it's this whole thing, you know, we all see these polls about, um, how people view Congress. I think now only something like 10, 11 percent of American voters have a favorable view of Congress. However, um, you ask any one voter about their own congressman, their favorability is over 50 percent. So not Ameri anymore. Well, not, not okay. anymore. But uh, yeah. or at least much higher than 10 percent. Yeah. Uh, Americans love their congressmen, but hate Congress, and so they're always says, "Hey, my guy." is doing a good job. I believe in my guy, but it's just the, the, the rest of the system is broken. And so that what that leads to is that nobody really gets kicked out. Nobody, you know, the incumbency rate of elected officials is, is, is incredibly high. What political reform at the national level do you see that could get us out of this stalemate, out of what, what's been happening in, in Washington, D.C.? You just, as I'm going back, going back to my key point, you need individuals of courage, who recognize a greater interest for America. Uh, in, in California, you need four great legislative leaders, business, labor, and the governor to get on the same page for a common agenda for California. Right, the moment we have that, we're gonna fix our problems. If you, don't, if you have leaders who are gonna go back to their old positions, unwilling to compromise, not have that discussion, we're gonna go to the position you stated, right? Yeah. And I'm more of an optimist than Okay. You well, are for that. Ca Cal for that California point. voters took it upon themselves to try to create some reform to create to to um, get through this uh, uh, um, backlog of, of legislation. And, and one of the, and let me talk of, about a few of them and get your reaction. One was to have a citizens commission for redrawing legislative and congressional lines. Um, what do you think about that, and how do you think it worked? Because it actually got implemented. Yeah, I think it worked pretty well. So you're to, you were totally in favor, and and you don't see any problems with the way it unfolded. Well, it's not it's not perfect. Obviously, it's still a political decision as to who sits on there, but the, the system generally worked pretty well. Okay, the top two uh, uh, system in terms of uh, um, uh, uh, partisan elections again for the state legislature and, and Congress. What do you think about that? Actually, first describe to the student how that that system worked, and, you know, and, and we implemented it for the first time. Sure, so we used to have primary elections where you would have the top voter get, vote getter in the Republican Party versus the top vote getter in the Democratic Party and you would have the other parties, Green Party, Peace and Freedom and others uh, go to the general election. Uh, we have today a party, an election where the top two, regardless of party, move forward. Now you can argue that people from uh, members of smaller parties don't get to participate in, in the final election but we have a process where it's supposed to produce more moderates. Whether we see that or not, uh, time will tell, uh, and whether it creates a better governing composition mm -hmm. in Sacramento, time will tell. Uh, but you know, it's what the voters choose, and it hasn't, at this point, proven to the detriment. But, but you like that reform? I, I'm okay with it. It hasn't demonstrated yeah. anything yet. So if you had a magic wand and could wave it, what political reforms in California would you like to see instituted? 
So I, we, we're starting to see a little bit of it. As dysfunctional as the system has been, part of my problem as the state's chief fiscal officer is that term limits really devastated institutional knowledge. So you had legislators who could have been there forever, and obviously there's a lot of deadwood, but I would argue government is like any other human institutions. You have high performers, you have average performers, and you have people who are dysfunctional. Uh, but what you need is certainly in that body, you need high performers who know how the body works. So I could talk to my legislative <coughs> friends and tell them the state is in cash crisis, we're running out of money, and frankly, none of them track it. Where in the old days, maybe you only had four or five people track it, but at least you had people tracking that issue and saying, it's a problem, let's work on this issue early, instead of me having to go to the caucuses and tell people the state's in financial trouble and you ought to start paying attention. But then you had, like you said, you had some deadwood in there and you had people who, who really solidified in their position. And, it, and uh, clearly when we go back to the um, graphs that we showed early on, when you had term limits, it actually created the opportunity for Latinos, African American, and, and Asians to be able to uh, capture elective office. Right. So but you still have deadwood today. Oh yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah. Um, deadwood that comes in no one particular color. Right. Um, so when you take a look at those graphs and you start talking about inclusion, and you, and you saw the tremendous amount of gains that uh, African American, Latinos, and Asians and women have made in California politics. Um, what in your mind explains that? Uh, California's changing. Uh, the, and so changing in terms of its composition. And I'm changing. asking you this question because that's the question that's going to be on the midterm for the students. So I just wanted to make sure that they're, <laughs> that they're, they're paying, paying attention. So the question is really what has led to inclusion? Oh, well, our demographics mm -hmm. have changed dramatically. Uh, and as it's just like anything, the old American immigrants, Italians, Germans, uh, Polish, uh, it, it's great. The, uh, we keep invigorating our people, and over a period of time, they become settled, they become part of the mainstream of uh, the United States of America, and so they have increased civic participation, including the importance of government. Uh, for the Asian Americans, part of the culture was stay away from government. It's viewed as corrupt, it's ugly, it's not, it doesn't have good social status, cer certainly doesn't pay uh, uh, as well as many of the sectors that uh, the Asian community really wanted to promote, mm -hmm. but over a period of time, they just recognize you can make, you can add value. So we, we've obviously documented the change and we've seen that, okay? You've talk, touched a little bit about what has caused it. What are the consequences? So what, what difference does it make that there is an Asian or a woman or a Latino in a state legislature? What difference does it make? I think it, first of all, it's the American ideal. Uh, that anybody can aspire to make any kind contribution. of symbolic difference. Yeah, it's, it's, it's what makes America special, the, uh, regardless of circumstance. And we know, frankly, that's not entirely true because if you're in the bottom 5% of poverty in America, your chances of getting to the top level are 4%. Mm -hmm. uh, so we really have to make sure that we beef up education and opportunities across the board to make sure that the American dream is within, is accessible to everybody. Uh, but it, the, it's not only the ideal of, of America, but it's the confluence of activities. And frankly, as you go into this century, we need every single American to reach their fullest promise to compete in a global economy. And so you can be Steve Jobs, you could be a medical doctor, you could be you know, energy secretary and come up with some new energies design. We can't leave any, anybody behind in this yeah. process. Earlier in our conversation, we talked about probably when you were growing up, it was about 50-50 in terms of uh, Asians registering to vote as either Democrats or Republicans. Today, about, uh, not necessarily the registration, but certainly in terms of how Asians vote, about 65, sometimes as high as 70% of Asians are voting for the Democrat, whether it's Obama for president or Brown for um, governor um, or you for state controller or state treasurer. It's, you've seen a tremendous shift in the party affiliation of Asians from Republican to, to Democrat. What, what accounts for that? Well, it's also a little bit up in the air. So actually, Asians are now targeted. For a long time, the Asians say, we're the margin of victory, and it wasn't accurate. But over well, the- Latinos what, used to say that. Yeah, well, they, well, what, well you're part of the base now. Yeah. Right? You're, you're part of the base of anybody, so right. they, you're, you're, you're core. Uh, but uh, 
the people who were running campaigns a few years ago say Arnold Schwarzenegger won the Asian American community by 36% of the vote. And so up until the fall of the last gubernatorial elections, a high propensity of the Asians were undecided. Right. So the Democratic Party targeted Asian Americans in California, and Governor Brown won the Asians by 17%. So they are they're starting to pay major force, and actually in the national elections, uh, both sides are targeting Asians in Virginia, Florida, and Nevada. Yeah, I'm going to ask you a question that I always hate when people ask me this question about Latinos. But um, what do Asian Americans in California want? What, is there an Asian American agenda, political agenda? Well, the Asian American agenda is the American agenda. I mean, it's as different as everybody else, right? You have recent immigrants who care, care about immigration policy. They care about access to health care, uh, care about education. And the Asian American community is not homogeneous. So it's incredibly, incredibly diverse with hundreds of hundreds, hundred plus different languages being spoken. Some economically and educationally well attained. Those who are uh, hope to reach that level. So it's not, it's as I point, it's not, a, it's not a monolith. So you have to go deeper into the communities. So one of the concerns I always have, especially for Latino and Asian voters, is, is the turnout rate. That um, while more than ever before, Latinos. Asians, African Americans are voting. It's still not what the California average is. What strategies are out there or what reforms or laws would you like to see to increase uh, voting for everybody, make it easier to vote? I would actually focus on the infrastructure. Mm -hmm. uh, Latinos have some organizations, Southwest and others. Uh, the Asians need to build the same infrastructure if they to educate, to highlight the importance to get out on election day or if you're going to vote from home to make sure that they participate in the process. Yeah, but electoral laws also impact that. I mean, I think this election we've been hearing a lot about um, voter suppression in some mm -hmm. of the states in terms of how laws are being changed, et cetera. Um, what laws in California do you think help or hinder uh, Asians, Latinos, or women, or any or any voter from uh, participating. Yeah, online registration, especially the, and we see a lot of those from the uh, disadvantaged communities mm -hmm. who don't really fully pay attention till the end. So those that give the opportunity. Well, talk about online registration because that's just came literally online came online th this week or last week. Right. Uh, um, talk a little bit about that. Yeah. So I don't know all the technical requirements, but obviously it creates a new avenue for people to participate uh, in the electoral process. I mean, you talked earlier about uh, California and, and, and uh, um, the national campaigns talking about a 21st century America or what have you. But, you know, really 21st century voting, we should be able to register online. And California just changed the law where you are allowed to register online. And then they uh, coordinate that with the um, driver's license, with DMV and, and others to confirm that you are that person. But what about um, same day registration? That is, where someone is not registered to vote, but on the day of election, they go and register and vote on that same day. Would you be for that? Well, the governor just signed the bill. Yeah, so. but, but it won't be implemented for this election. Right. But that's uh, right. So are, are you for that? You yeah, think that's with a good the uh, appropriate security, absolutely. Yeah, and then what about other electoral laws in terms of um, right now, California, and it was actually one of the first states in 19, 78 or so that allowed for vote by mail without any excuse. Before that, you had to actually had to have an excuse, either a medical excuse or proof, like an airline ticket or what have you, that you were going to be out of the state and needed to vote by mail. Now you can vote by mail if you want to. You, you just sign up and, and, and you do it. Um, how about uh, early voting, where you can go to a government building or what have you and just start voting. We, you know, we know when the election is, we know who the candidates are, it's already been determined, you can't have any more candidates. Why can't you go and vote tomorrow if you've made up your mind? Yeah. Are, you, are you in favor of uh, yes, early yes. voting? Yes, yeah. yes. How, how would that work? What, what prevents us from doing that? Who, who, who's against that or is there, are there structural problems that will prevent us from implementing early voting? There may be some implementation issues, but they do it in Oregon and Washington, so it, sh it shouldn't be a major impediment. So are there other uh, political reforms that you would like to see uh, now that you know, we're in election season, people are thinking about elections, people are thinking about how do we expand the ability of people to vote. Is there, are there any ideas that are floating around in Sacramento that talk about expanding the, the vote? Uh, I, I haven't heard any. But online voting, uh, vote by mail, um, all of those, you would think that, um, that there should, really are no more structural impediments. So why don't we have 100% 
voter turnout. Yeah, we should hit, we, well, some people unfortunately don't care about the process, uh, but we should make it as easy as possible for people to participate in you know, the decision making that's critical to our democracy. So when you start thinking and preparing for 2014, because you're gonna be a candidate for statewide office, um, to, uh, explain to the students the type of, because you've gone through this now twice before in terms of statewide office, about the in type of infrastructure that you have to put together to be a viable candidate, the type of money you have to raise. How much money do you have to raise to be a viable candidate for state treasurer in 2014? Yeah, it's, it's a fortune. It's, it's, a, it's a incredibly expensive. So obviously, when you have 17 million registered voters in the state of California, mm -hmm and to communicate to them with a certain amount of frequency, uh, and whether it's TV or mail, uh, those dollars add up very, very quickly. So conservatively, you're looking at, uh, to where run a bare bones campaign, $5 million. How much did you spend the first time you ran for control? Uh, about four, four plus. And the second time? Uh, far less. Because uh, you, you were much well known. Uh, yeah. we so were, you think you we need to raise- We were 18 points ahead in the polls. You need to raise, Five million dollars? We're looking at, well, obviously it depends on what the others are raising, but you, you have to raise at least five. Are there, is there any scenario that you can see that would lead you not to run for state treasurer, but for another office? Uh, you know, I love what I'm doing. I'm not gonna speculate on all the hypotheticals. But I love to speculate. I mean, that's, <laughs> like, that's what politics is all about. Who's in, who's out, who's up, who's down. What, what's, go, what's going on? Yeah, so. it's a, you know, you're, you're begging to go to law school. Yeah, okay. Well, um, w one uh, last question. If you weren't an elected official, what would you be doing? Uh, well, I always say I like to have my, have, as my last career, uh, be a teacher. Okay, like what kind of teacher? Uh, professor. Uh, this position's taken, so we're not, we're not <laughs> going to have you not on going, here anymore. Not, not going like, after your position. All right. Well, uh, we want to thank. Uh, um, okay, one quick question. Um, can you touch briefly on the budgetary concern with regards to incarceration? Uh, given that the majority of incarcerations are due to the so called war on drugs, which most economists say is a drain on the, econ um, the economy, costing millions of dollars to the state and perhaps billions to national budgets. On a strictly economic basis, do you feel that the war on drugs is benefiting or hurting California? And given that many of those incarcerated are uh, minorities who after incarceration uh, face stigmatization um, and thus decreased uh, employment opportunities, do you think the drug war unfairly targets minorities at a great cost to the state? And is this somehow justifiable um, on an economic basis? And is this part of the dysfunctional system that you were yeah, we have a huge population. Well, why don't you, re why don't you repeat the question? <laughs> well, uh, well, you were basically getting to the economic the economic pre premise of our incarceration and uh, it, it, a high focus on as its application to people from emerging communities. And so we, we've, we need to redesign our incarceration program uh, for a whole host of issues. So uh, cl clearly those with drugs uh, lead, drug issues um, create huge issues not only with themselves but society. Uh, so we need alternative programs to try to target those, handle those better, especially in terms of repeat officials, uh, repeat offenses. And then it does have an impact on emerging communities. Uh, that's part of the discussion as to whether you legalize marijuana or not. Do you create, do you make that issue more widespread throughout the community and what are the associated uh, co uh, costs associated with if you choose to take that particular route? So. Um, so do you think we should legalize marijuana? No. I mean, our last three presidents have all admitted to uh, knowledge of marijuana, <laughs> whether they inhaled or not. Yeah. Okay. Um, there is an, another initiative on the ballot that repeals the death penalty in the state of California. What's your position on that? The, uh, I have personal fundamental issues with the death penalty. I also recognize it as a penalty for some. So, th so this is personal. My sister was murdered. Mm -hmm. uh, so the, uh, as Catholics, our family had always been opposed to the death penalty. But just watching the anguish my mom had to deal with, uh, it, I said my mom goes to church daily. She lost her faith for two years. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, on my own issues, the, wouldn't want to go there, but recognizing it for people like my mom as a, an appropriate punishment. 
So, I mean, it was um, widely known about what happened to your sister in terms of the newspapers and all that. Did you want to share with the students what the uh, situation was in terms of what was public and, and what, what happened? Uh, well, my sister was working uh, at the Immigration and Naturalization Service as an attorney in 1999. Uh, she was working on a Saturday. Her friends uh, took her, dropped her off at Starbucks, and then she disappeared. Um, and so her body was found three months later so badly decomposed coming out of a river that the only way we identified my sister was uh, through DNA tests. So a very tough time. And so when, when you deal with those type of issues and then you have to formulate public policy, I mean, how could you not have your personal history impact public policy? Not just on, on this issue, but whether you're a parent or you're not, whether you have kids in the public school district or private school, I mean, it, that's, uh, it's just inherent in public policy making. Mm -hmm. and, and when you come up with somebody who disagrees with you on one issue because their stand is so personal, either religious based or you know where they're from, how do you how do you deal with them when you feel so right about you know the the, the other way? How does how do those type of dialogues happen in Sacramento or in Washington D.C.? Oh, in Sacramento, well, I try to be respectful. Uh, people have value. You may not agree uh, on this particular issue, but it doesn't mean their point doesn't have merit. So, what's um, when when you th when you think about the the future of the state, and, and you think about all the challenges that that, that it's is facing, what is it about California that that because you previously mentioned you're optimistic? Wh what are the two or three things about California that make you optimistic? make you a, a public servant? Well, it's a magnet for people who have dreams, right? I'm not saying other states don't, right? But we just have this incredible diversity. It is a global world. So if we can learn how to live with each other, play with each other, work with each other, the access to ideas, access to cultures, access to opportunities is absolutely phenomenal. Uh, and our challenges are hard, but we can overcome them. What do we do? educate the heck out of our kids, fix the money system. So yes, people are going to have to assume some responsibility. We can't spend everything at once, but I didn't. I came out of law school with mortgage debt, transportation debt, uh, student, student loan, loan debt. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I forgot the big one. Yeah. Uh, and over a period of time, you know, I paid down debt. So the, I didn't have great meals that, that I sometimes do now. I didn't have a great car, but it all worked out fine. right? Worked out a solid middle class living, bought my first house, which is now my mom's retirement home. So you can still build a great living. And, and the great thing is with technology, with education, you can change your life in a, in a flash, in a moment today. Yeah. So. And, and California, it welcomes anybody, whether you're from Chicago via Tampa or Washington, I'm an immigrant. D.C. Yeah, you're, I'm an immigrant. You're, you're an immigrant to California. So uh, John Chung, thank you for coming to uh, Loyola Marymount University. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you.